All right, when and where did you first become acquainted with blues music? Uh, during uh, uh, during my uh, the time I spent at the Macambo Lounge. What's the Macambo Lounge? It was a night spot where uh, all the musicians used to come in and jazz after uh, four o'clock and uh, and uh, really let their hair down. Could you recall for us your early impressions of Southside Chicago back in 1946 and what events led you to record a thing called Union Man Blues and Bilbo's Dead? Well, as far as the, the events in Chicago in 1946, I don't think it's much different than it is now, uh, except that we're not, uh, uh, you're not as segregated as you used to be. Uh, you have people uh, uh, ever living all over all through Chicago, white as well as colored on the south side. And uh, what led me re to record Union Man Blues was uh, I had an artist uh, during the, during my uh, ownership of the Macambo Lounge, uh, during a jam session, I, I uh, picked up a, an artist that was jamming and uh, we thought it would be make a good addition to the combo I had in there as a vocalist. And after uh, employing him, er, the, him there as a, wo as a vocalist, uh, I had numerous record companies uh, speak to this uh, fella, Andrew Tibbs. And after two, three weeks of uh, various companies hitting on him, I uh, asked them what, uh, what they wanted, and they told me they wanted to record him. And after kicking around a little bit, I figured they, they know something. They're in the business, and I was green. I didn't know anything about it. I said, they want to record him. He must be good. So we went ahead and recorded him. How about Bilbo's Dead? Well, well that was the other side of uh, Union Man Blues. That was the flip side. Although we did have a lot of trouble with it at first. It was right after uh, uh, Bilbo Dead in, in the South, and... Uh, uh, this writer who wrote the song, who I remember was Andrew Tibbs, uh, he, he he wrote a lot of meanings that uh, were in between line meanings, and uh, we had a little trouble with uh, the law enforcements in the South at that time. Of course, we're going back 20, 20 some years, and uh, a lot of those records were broken up right out of the, from the record shop's shelves. Could you uh, give us your candid impressions, Leonard, about such artists as Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, Bo Diddley, Wolf, Little Waller, any of them? Any of them? Chuck Berry first. Uh, let's let's go in rotation. Chuck Berry was born after Muddy Waters. He was uh, one of our first artists. I think uh, Andrew Tibbs when was our first rec recording of Union Man Blues and uh, Bilbo's Dead. And that record uh, was a pretty big record, and then uh, the artists started coming in. And Muddy Waters came in there and uh, asked me if he could record, and I listened to him. Of course, uh, being owner of the club and having various talents come in, uh, well, he, he sang a song, and I got the goose pimples, and I felt that was he had something there because it affected me. And that was the first recording of Muddy Waters. What was Muddy's first recording? Oh, I think uh, Honey Bee, or I, I, I really don't recall. Did you oh, personally I, do the session? I can be sad. I, I yeah, did most of the recording. Uh, for uh, the first record was uh, recorded Universal, but after the first record, we. Uh, Accumulated some money and uh, we built uh, our own console with a uh, tape recorder, and uh, we used to do our own recording, our, our own engineering. How about Bo Diddley? Your first impressions of him, or your candid, candid impressions of Bo Diddley? Oh, uh, Bo Diddley came in the studio and uh, he sang. Uh, uh, he he sang a song of uh, hand bones. I I I I don't know whoever may be listening to this. Uh, tape uh, may be much younger than I am, but uh, that was a popular song years ago. Uh, 
And uh, I told him I couldn't use it because the song was out and uh, could go back home and change it around. And he did and uh, came up with Bo Diddley. How about Chuck Berry? Well, Chuck Berry was... Uh, was struggling. He went to um, many record companies. Uh, I think in Chicago, uh, mostly. I th he was. Went to, he told me that he went to see Mercury and they turned him down. And uh, he went to Columbia. And we had used to be a local label called Premium Records. And they turned him down. And uh, I, he walked in and I listened to his tape. He had a he had a tape recorder and a song on it uh, called Light of Red, which was more of a Western type of song. And I told him that I wasn't interested in any uh, Western music. And again, I told him to go back and change it around to something in, that I was familiar with. And uh, he came back and uh, uh, with his band, uh, who consisted of three pieces, him and uh, piano player and... Uh, a drummer, and I think uh, I added Willie Dixon to the session, and uh, we cut Maybelline. Uh, it was, uh, I didn't think much of uh, of of this uh, particular song, and, uh, and uh, about two weeks later I made a trip to New York, and I had a dub with me. And Alan Freed was a disc jockey in New York at that time at WINS. And I gave him the dub, and I says, uh, play this. And uh, he played it. He said, what's the name of this? I don't know. He said, what's the name of the artist? I don't know. Just play it. And he played it. And by the time I got back to Chicago, I had calls from my distributors that wanted to know what, re what type of record did I give Alan Free to play. How about your candid impressions of uh, Howlin' Wolf? Well, Howlin' Wolf I met in uh, West Memphis, Arkansas. I say it early early fifties could be nineteen fifty one, and uh, uh, modern record recorded him on a thing uh, called "Howling Howling for My Baby," and uh, they never signed him. Nothing happened to the record. I uh, I went ahead and recorded him and. Uh, uh, with a with a song called "How Many More Years," and uh, he took off like wildfire. He's a uh, he's a country country gentleman. How about Little Walter Leonard? Well, Little Walter was uh, one of uh, Muddy's men in his band. Uh, he played the harp for Muddy, and we got through with a session, and uh, we were just jamming around, and he played this juke that later on we, we called it Juke. At that time, he just played an instrumental, and it came out pretty good. And uh, we uh, we released it, and uh, that made Little Walter, and Little Walter went out on his own after that record. You and Phil experimented with various sounds and techniques that revolutionized the rhythm and blues industry. Could you tell us, for example, how you hit upon that famous one-tenth of a second delay? How did you hit upon that? That was mostly tape echo, what they call now. At that time, I don't think we knew what it was. It was uh, just uh, uh, turning up the knob to a level where we'd get feedback. And uh, you turn you turn up enough of it, just so it don't cause you no distortion, just get, give you enough feedback and liveness to give you that one tent, which later on was became very popular. Was this in place of a of an echo chamber? Uh, that time, they didn't, that was it. At that time, there wasn't such a thing as an echo chamber. Well, you had mentioned some time ago, Leonard, about putting up a pipe or some such thing. Well, you want first, to tell us about that? Uh, the first echo chamber we built in in our studio in the back of our office was, uh, uh, we got a, I think it was about a 18-inch sewer pipe, and uh, two lengths of it was probably, the length of it must have been about 24 feet, and we hung it at the, in the ceiling in a back room. We put uh, a mic on one side of it and a speaker on the other, and that gave us the echo. You made some pretty important talent discoveries, both you and Phil, during your tours through the South. Did you not, Len? Yes, I've, I've been very fortunate, lucky, I should say, more than 
unfortunate. How important to Chess Checker was the work of blues great Willie Dixon? Well, he wound up to be a very good writer. Uh, he's, uh, he had a lot of hits that he's written. And uh, we, were, we were pretty good as a team. Uh, our, we, our, our main, the, he, he wrote the song, and I listened to it, and there was something in the song that I had to catch, catch my ear, whether it was pertaining to love or pertaining to suffering, but something that, that caught me. And once we picked the song out, we would go for a uh, sustained riff in the background, and I'd have everybody play a different type of riff that would, play this, that would fit this particular song. And uh, we came up with that riff. And in fact, uh, one of those riffs, I was sitting in a movie watching The, the Golden Arm, uh, if some of you recall with Frank Sinatra and uh, I, the one some of you that did see the picture you remember that horn riff used to come out like uh, mm -hmm. break and I sat there and I scratched my head I said man this, this is my riff <laughs> and uh, that riff was actually uh, done up in the studio where we we tried various riffs to fit the song for a sustained riff in the background and uh, th that was one of them. Larry, could you tell us anything about the 1948 session that produced the Muddy Waters recording of Rolling Stone? I think Rolling Stone was uh, a Muddy Waters composition. He, he wrote that. And uh, it was actually taken off of an old expression, uh, Rolling, uh, Rolling Stone don't get her no moss. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote the composition. and. Uh, very good and became very popular. The chess checker sound turned up later in a, in a lot of pop records. Can you recall some specific examples and what do you think about the early attempts by the pop people and major record firms to cover R&B hits? Well, uh, I, I hate to talk about another company, but I think that records uh, who was uh, owned and uh, supervised uh, by Randy Wood from Gallatin, Tennessee, uh, he got his first start in uh, taking an R&B song and uh, recording it with, uh, with a white artist. Of course, there was uh, no fla no uh, f nothing was added to it to make it uh, pop flavor. Uh, in fact, the ring was copied from the from uh, one of our records, and uh, and all they did was have a white singer sing it. Can you give me an example of that, Leonard? Well, I'll Be Home by Pat Boone was, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, was a, he had a million record seller on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Sincerely by the McGuire's. Well, who did them originally is what I'm trying to get uh, Well, the, uh, I'll Be Home was uh, done in our, in our studios by the Flamingos. I picked that song up in Shreveport, Louisiana. I don't know what made me pick up that song, but, uh, but out of about 30, 40 songs, I brought this one back and I had the Flamingos do it. Sincerely was uh, done by McGuire's sisters and was done by the Moonglows originally. Most of all was another one that the Moonglows written and recorded and uh, done up by uh, McGuire's sisters. Oh, we had uh, numerous songs. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the Rolling Stone group from England uh, made their fame on... Uh, uh, some of our compositions that uh, we produced in our own studios that we gave birth to, and the Beatles and the Beatles made their name on a lot of our tunes. Mm -hmm. What major changes, Leonard, have you noticed in rhythm and blues music of 1946 and the present? Any major changes that you can see between what was being done in '46 and what's being done now with R&B tunes and recordings? Well, no, it's, uh, it's changed around quite a bit. Uh, it's not no more that the white artist covers a Negro artist and then the white buy it because uh, uh, the trend has changed to, uh, such a, in such a way that uh, no matter what color the artist is, it's still bought by white or by the colored artist. 
uh, mostly it's, they had a strength to it. They uh, pronounced their words a little clearer. Uh, but I, I don't personally see no, uh, no greater changes. The British singer Eric Burden told me recently that, in his opinion, Chuck Berry would have become a big star as Elvis Presley in this country if Chuck Berry had been Caucasian. What are your feelings in this respect? I, th I think Chuck Berry was a big artist, uh, and it, uh, I don't think uh, the Caucasian part would have helped him any. Uh, Chuck Berry was good. He was contented with what he was doing. He wasn't looking at higher uh, in, a, in higher windows. That's all, and uh, I think uh, that that's the thing that kept him back. Chuck, Chuck Berry wanted to do his own producing, his own arranging, his own writing, and uh, it cannot be done. I think uh, at this point he's real he's realizing that. Do you think, Leonard? that uh, you don't think then that his color had anything to do with the fact that he did not achieve the fame that an Elvis Presley received? I don't think the color did, uh, did it. It was the trend of uh, the market and the buying power, uh, which there is no differential at, at this time, that at that time it did exist. Uh, we're going back uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and uh, that kept them from becoming an Elvis Presley and uh, Chuck Berry was shaking his knees before El before I ever heard of it. Elvis Presley. Uh, it's been said that a lot of talents dropped in and out of the blue during the two years that Aristocrat Record Company was in existence, and that some of the some other famous artists came to you in a similar manner from after Chess Records was formed. Uh, how about some recollections of those days and the Chess Brothers' rather unusual method of discovering blues talent? Did they just come in out of blues? Is that true? They just dropped in and, and knock on your door or what? No, I used to travel by car to the south quite a bit. And, uh, in fact, I used to have a magna cord. Uh, some of you probably don't know it. They haven't heard of that name, but uh, it was a very popular tape, mach uh, tape recorder at one time. And I used to carry one in the car and uh, record them right on uh, on location, where it would be on a plantation farm, or it would be in a radio station. I uh, I remember I recorded a hit one time during a record being played on the air. They only had one board, and uh, one channel was used for the air, and then the other channels was used to record this artist. And the artist had to get through in the length of that record. Leonard, you once you once mentioned to me, this is, as you know, is going to be all dubbed out so John Land at Carol A could take this out, but I think it'd be interesting to the listeners, that how you would take a record and go into a town, into the South, for instance, uh, with records in the trunk of your car and go to a radio station and get the local disc jockey to play it and then call on, would you would you tell us about that? That's really a very interesting thing. Oh, I, I used to walk in a town and uh, create a demand before I, I uh, actually went to my distributor. When I opened up uh, the front door of my distributor, he would ask me, uh, have I got the record with me? And uh, although times have changed and uh, uh, you can't do those things anymore, you've got to wait for a record day and uh, uh, you got to go through the PD, you have to go through the music director before a record is put on. At one time we used to go in there and uh, the disc jacket was on the air and he'd take the record out of your hand and put it right on the turntable and play it. And that's how you knew? Mm-hmm. 